of Chicago's history, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. And tonight and tomorrow, WGN's Mike Lowe will guide us through the events and explore their impact on our lives today. Here is part one of A Distant Fire. In the spot where Mrs. O'Leary's barn stood 150 years ago is now the Chicago Fire Academy, where a twisting steel flame serves as a monument to the city's destruction and resurrection. Here began the Chicago Fire of 1871. In some ways, it's where the story of Chicago really started. Pretty much as soon as the, uh, as the fire was out, the city of Chicago has been telling the story of the Great Chicago Fire. It became the Great Chicago Fire fairly quickly. Uh, it became a story about resilience and rebuilding and being tough. And it's interesting that even as we look back 150 years later, uh, quite little has changed about how we tell the story. Today, nearly every Illinois politician invokes the calamity as an example of resilience and triumph. They know that what Reverend Collier said right after the Great Chicago Fire was right. We work together to help each other out of our troubles. On the eve of the 150th anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire, let's match and exceed the determination of our ancestors who literally rebuilt this city out of the charred ashes and laid the foundation for the great global city that we are today. In a strange way, the fire is more about the city's creation than its destruction. And the idea that this place is so powerful, the future is so much on its side, that it's, the, the lesson of its destruction is that it's indestructible. Northwestern University professor Carl Smith is the author of Chicago's Great Fire, a book praised as the definitive history of the disaster and recovery. It's a kind of second birth. You know, Chicago as we know it, modern Chicago, is basically only 40 years old at the time of the fire. So nothing but a, a tiny outpost in 1830 and 1871, it's got 330,000 people. Chicago's geography, located between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River, made it the key location in American commerce and communication, connecting the industrial east to the riches of the west. All railroads led to Chicago. The population was rising, and so were new homes built cheaply and hastily, almost entirely out of wood, with a new technique called the balloon frame. The streets, the sidewalks, even some of the water pipes are made of wood, um, tar paper roofs, hay, coal, even um, manure. Julius Jones is the curator of the Chicago History Museum's new exhibit, City on Fire, which explores the conditions that led to the fire, wood, and the weather. For months, Chicago had been unusually dry and unseasonably hot, a metropolis poised to burn several days over 80 degrees and then finally you had strong winds blowing out of the southwest. Nearly two dozen fires had broken out in Chicago during the month of October 1871. One of the big fires was called the Saturday Night Fire which was literally the night before the big one. Adam Rubin is the director of interpretation for the Chicago Architecture Center. He says that marathon 17-hour Saturday night firefight depleted and fatigued the ranks of the city's 185 firemen. They were exhausted. It took a long time to get that fire out. That By the time that uh, the O'Leary family's barn begins to burn, your fire department is exhausted. The next night, Sunday, October 8th, between 8 and 9 o'clock, another fire started in the barn of Patrick and Catherine O'Leary on the near west side. Despite the long-running myth that Mrs. O'Leary was milking a cow which kicked over a lamp, we don't actually know how or why it started there. It's very, very unlikely she had anything to do with it. She was already in bed with her husband and five children asleep in their small cottage. Uh, and but she was this illiterate, immigrant, Irish, Catholic woman. So she was a kind of perfect person to blame, among other things, because she also was, was what can I say, uh, not dangerous, except in her clumsiness, let's say. It wasn't a, a, some inherent problem in the system, uh, which was really why Chicago burned, that the city was built so poorly. The way the story of the fire comes together is one that puts the blame on an immigrant puts the blame on an Irish immigrant at a period of time that 
uh, the Irish are seen as other. They're seen as not American. They're seen um, as not deserving. When the fire started, it was seen almost as entertainment, but that soon turned to concern and then panic as strong winds swept the flames across the north side and downtown areas. How does a fire grow so big so fast that it gets caught up in the air, swirls in the sky, and leaps from building to building. The combination of the wind and the updraft from the fire itself. So it takes pieces of wooden Chicago between the throws them up in the air. Those swirling tornadoes of fire are called fire devils. One supposedly swept up a 12-foot long beam and dropped it on the roof of the Chicago pumping station next to the water tower. People talk about the irony. There wasn't a drop of water to fight a fire in this place. Uh, and then the Chicago essentially had no water by 3 a.m. 100-foot walls of fire were enclosing on the city and its people, leaping across the Chicago River twice. By the time it got to the downtown, it's a half a mile wide, it, but the fire's all over the place because of these pieces that are in the air. And, it, you know, it, 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 it's extraordinarily hot. People talk about it in terms of a few things. In terms of war, they think of it as, as the devil, as the fire fiend. You know, and they talk, they reach for any kind of metaphor they can, a river of fire, a cataract of fire, but it's, it's this, this thing which seems to have a, a life of its own. Some waded into the lake to escape the extreme heat and smoke. Others desperately tried to grab what they could save and run from the flames. The fire raged for 30 hours, ending only when it ran out of things to burn and rain began to fall on October 10th. Headlines across the world screamed fire, destruction of Chicago, the great calamity of the age, and Chicago in ruins. The Tribune described it as a conflagration which has no parallel in the annals of history. 300 people died, a third of the city was left homeless, and the burn zone, which encompassed the entire downtown and north side, was reduced to ash and rubble. It looks like another world, you know, it's just this ghostly place. Uh, it's just so, this busiest place in America is suddenly so silent and just charred and, and, and it's just full of these rubble and ruins and it stays hot for a few days. There was no safety net or disaster relief agency, but the world sent aid to Chicago and the next day the Tribune wrote an inspiring editorial proclaiming, Chicago shall rise again. One business owner set out a sign on his shack that summed up Chicago's will to rebuild. It's on display at the History Museum. All gone but wife, children, and energy. <laughs> right. The city's energy proved to be fireproof. In less than 20 years, the city grew once again to over one million people. And today, there are a handful of buildings that still survive. Churches, homes, and that iconic symbol of the city, the water tower. Every time I see the water tower in the shadow of the Hancock Center, the contrast is really what comes out for me. It's you, you're able in that moment to see the old city and the new city right up next to each other. And it really gives you that feeling of resilience and of history. Even as we remember the fire as a pivot from the past to the future, as the event that ignited Chicago's evolution, the great disaster also revealed some difficult truths about our city, truths that 150 years later are still burning in the aftermath of a distant fire. In Chicago, Mike Lowe, WGN News. Very interesting, Amazing. Mike. The cloudy and showery conditions will linger a bit longer than summer-like temps return. Demetrius Ivory's back with your full forecast at 9.30. And still ahead of...